centuries ago, somewhere in the deeper, temperate forests of Europe. It had all happened so fast. Men in scratched-up armor and torn rag tabards of the Knights Templar filled the road. The family of six Romani travelers, on their way to catch up with the remainder of the caravan, were set upon. The horses were grabbed, screaming, by the reins. Her brother sent an arrow into one man's eye, another man's shoulder, and into a third man's collarbone before he was pulled down. Father only killed one before a blow to the head sent him sprawling. Turnips and silk was all they had to offer, but they wanted more. Father and brother were taken away into the tree line, never to be seen alive again. Mother and the three daughters were kept to suffer. While the horse was butchered for meat and the cart hacked to pieces for a roaring fire, the women were tied down and used while others played games with throwing knives waiting their turn. Bruises, blood, and bite marks dotted them all until they were little more than lifeless husks on the ground. Music was played around the bonfire, making their long black shadows dance in the setting sun. The smallest of the three girls slipped her ropes after dark. Not daring to try and free the others, she crept away into the night. Holding herself sorely between the legs and cradling a twisted arm, she gave a flitting little shriek when she emerged from the thicket and fell onto a muddy old road. She lay there, stunned, then slowly rolled on her back to weep. Why? Why? She curled to one side in the fetal position, naked and bleeding by the roadside. Her wavy, dark hair soaked itself into the mud. She cried for hours while the moon crawled its way across the sky, clouds and other dark things peering at her in the blackness. She wished the cruel night would just kill her and end her misery and shame. Mother. Father. All of them. Dead. Or may as well have been. They'd no doubt cut their throats when they were good and done. Oh, God. Why? The scratches the forest had given her in her hasty escape began to grow hot and pulse upward into angry red whelps. Footsteps. She laid very still. Maybe whoever it was would think her dead. What's this? It was a woman's voice. She deflated in relief. Lost your way, have you? A foot less than gently touched her shoulder and rolled her flat onto her back. A wide-brimmed hat hid all but the shine of her eyes. Ah, still alive, she murmured. The moonlight showed her everything there was to see. Barely, she admitted softly. The young woman stared up at her with a helpless, dead-eyed look that prostitutes sometimes got when they were in the profession for too long. She did not have the will to move. Whoever did this to you, are they still nearby? She asked. A thick pack and bedroll clanked with metal and glass when she leaned over her. No response. Do you speak English, gypsy girl? No response. She repeated the question in French, then Italian, and then again in English. The girl would not speak. The woman knelt, pressing the pad of her thumb on her wrist. Alive. Traumatized. Well, I'm not about to leave a poor thing like you naked and bleeding on the roadside. Leaning with surprising strength, she put the young woman over her shoulders like a lost lamb, holding her arms and legs in a firm grip. The young girl slipped into exhausted darkness after that.
When she awoke again, there was a campfire and a wooden tripod holding a melon-sized black cauldron. The woman in shadow was illuminated as a pale, crimson-lipped thing with bright and shining eyes. There was a strange sort of mist drifting from her gaze when she was still enough it made her look otherworldly. We're a few hundred paces off the road. If someone is hunting you, it's not likely they'll find you here. Slowly, the girl sat up. She found her bare midriff covered with leaves and strange slimes to hold them on. The warm, angry buzzing of her wounds had diminished into a glistening winter cold sensation. She picked at herself a little. Enough of that. You'll not mend properly if you peel everything off, the woman said, flipping a few more sticks onto the fire and leaning over the cauldron. The girl peered at her curiously. The woman was dressed in a long black traveler's robe, stitched with silver threads and marked with mud around the hems. The large pillow sleeves were strangely shaped and rattled when she moved. What was she hiding? There was a knife on her hip as well. Sit up if you can. I'll feed you, she said over her shoulder, leaning this way and that until the flames turned from orange to a sickly green color. There we are. She gestured with a smile. It's called a look-away fire. If someone sees it, they simply wander by as though we weren't there. Very clever, if I do say so myself. She seemed to relax at last and settled to sit on her legs. When she turned, the supernatural flames made her pale skin look green and sickly, like she'd been struck with a plague. The girl shuddered. Well, let's start with your name, then, she said, pushing a steaming bowl of something thick into her hands. The girl leaned against the tree. She'd been told tales to never give one's name to witches or wanderers or vagabonds. Magic was strong in these elder woods, and the people that wielded it could steal your soul. She stared at the ground. Hmm... Well, until you tell me, I'll call you Melody. Understand? The woman waited for her to nod. I can probably guess what happened to you, Melody. Were you traveling with your family? A caravan, perhaps? She received a nod. So there were many of them. All men. Another meek nod while she tentatively tasted whatever it was in the bowl. She made a face. I'm not the best cook, <laughs> she sympathized. The heated slurry filled her belly with heat and life. The young girl drank greedily when she felt warmth inside herself again. Your family, then, are they still alive when you saw them last? The girl gave a timid sort of shrug. When you've regained your strength, we'll fetch them either way. The girl looked startled, but the woman held up a hand before she could protest. I have my ways, child. Don't worry for me. If one of those men were powerful enough to get his hands around my neck, we would have far more to worry about. She paused. A black bird came shrieking down from the treetops, landing right on the woman's hat. Oh yes, hello again, she said reaching up with a fist. The hook-taloned bird stepped daintily onto her arm, careful not to draw blood. She brought it down so the girl could see. Have you found our prey, then? Squawk, flappy wings, squawk. Not far from here, then, even with the fire. She touched her chin with a sigh. All right, no time like the present, I suppose. She dusted off the top of her legs. Come, child, if you want your family back, we must move now. If those men that attacked you are on the move, the slowest ones will stay behind to cut their throats, no doubt. 
Reaching, the dark-clad woman pulled the knife from her hip and gave it to her, handle first. You can sit here and play the role of the helpless maiden that's lost her maidenhead, or, she drew herself up to her full height, you can stand and exact your revenge upon everyone that ever hurt you. The girl's innocence died when the tips of her fingers touched the knife's handle. It was heavy and metallic in her hands. She turned it over a few times, violent fantasies already beginning to form. She looked up at her savior, eager but unsure. You do not fight, child. You lie in wait. Understand? A silent nod as she wobbled to her feet, then leaned on the tree for support. When she was steady and the bowl of hot, sloppy, whatever it was, was gone, they set out. Barbs and branches seemed to lean away from the bizarre, pale woman as they made their way through the underbrush. Insects fled from her. A wild dog stared at her with bright yellow eyes and then gave her a wide berth. The Roma girl wondered just what sort of woman she was. When the pale lady reached to push a branch aside, there was a flash of ink on her skin. Her body was as pale as parchment. Had she gotten tattoos to decorate it? The moon peered from between the clouds, casting a silvery light on the camp. Dawn was coming. Pink was touching the horizon, but only just barely. The morning fog clung to the ground. She left the girl in the thicket to hide, stepping out into the open. The men that were still breaking down tents and stomping out campfires stopped to stare at her as the black traveler's cloak slipped away. A form-fitting blood-red tunic and a black leather belt flashed by the first man as a light gesture seared off the top of his skull. No one saw a weapon or even a flash of magic or light. He simply fell, missing everything from his eyelids upward. Where are the gypsy children? Her voice concussed as she touched a jagged rune on her neck. There was a mad dash for weapons and rope, shouting and swearing and pointing, before one of the bonfires suddenly quadrupled in size and engulfed a dozen men in angry, shrieking flames. The girl watched the pale woman walk forward at a slow, measured pace. One lucky Templar got close enough to swing his sword, only for the blade to explode like glass. She palmed his face and he screamed under the hiss of acid and flame until his skull was visible. She slammed him onto his back, turning about with a harsh gesture. A tree uprooted itself and rolled wildly, smashing man and horse and more as it went. The young girl stood in shadow, eyes wide. A spray of blood spattered the woman's clothes and vanished instantly. She made a fist and a stake of sharpened wood sprang from her sleeve. Stab. 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 Men lost eyes and cheeks and jugulars in the controlled whirlwind of violence and savage chuckling. The fallen tree burst into flames, herding more of them in her direction. Lifting her wide-brimmed hat for just a moment, she gave an animalistic lick of her lips. Cries of demon and monster rang out over the encampment. Nothing quite so exotic, I'm afraid, which will have to do for you lot. She made a harsh gesture, and her sleeve-mounted stakes lanced away with deadly accuracy, taking two men's legs out from under them. Blood pooled around her feet as she walked among the hurt and dying. A man in full armor and helmet stepped forward, lifting a Templar-symboled shield. The red cross offended her. 
The pale woman reached at him like she was about to crush an apple. The man's helm collapsed in on itself, and he fell with a spray of blood blasting out of the front of his helmet. Bow and arrow was wrenched free from horses and saddles. A short line of men aimed to volley. A light gesture set their weapons ablaze and sent them shrieking. Horrified but fascinated, the gypsy girl slowly emerged from shadow, clutching the knife in both hands. The whirlwind of blood and magic carved a swath through the encampment. Men on horses were thrown, shrieking into the treetops as branches came alive and strung them up to hang by their necks. Rocks blasted themselves apart to fill the air with jagged shrapnel. The air was thick with screaming. Who, who are you? What are you? A man was on his knees before her, bleeding from the face and missing an eye. I, the pale woman said, leaning down to cup his cheek like a mother would her child, have many names. To that family of gypsies you slaughtered, I am a savior. To the girl creeping this way with my knife in her hands, I am a hero. To the surrounding countryside, I am a swamp witch. Reaching, she lifted him into the air by the throat while he weakly pawed at her wrists and arms. And to you? <laughs> I am the Reaper. She turned and threw him with such strength that his body burst apart like a melon of red paint on the rocks. The young gypsy girl stared up at her when she arrived. Let's find your family. Come. She turned and walked with authority. What little resistance found them was cast aside like so much filth. They came at last to the scene on the edge of the burning encampment. Mother and sisters were dead, still staked, spread eagle to the ground with rope. Father's sword and brother's bow was sitting in a pile of junk to one side. All the turnips had been eaten, empty bags flung to the ground. The silk was missing. The Roma girl moved quickly, sawing away at the ropes and throwing scraps and blankets over them for their dignity too late. They'd been too late. All of them. All of them dead. She cried. The next explosion of violence did not make her turn to see, nor the next, nor the next. One man made it very, very close to her, and her back was splashed in a shower of blood and bits of flesh. The pale woman let her cry, slaughtering any that came near, and even some that did not. She counted roughly one hundred dead, and a handful scattering through the woods in a wild panic. The wolves would pull them down eventually. The girl stood, naked and liquid red all over, turning back to the scene of carnage. She clutched the knife in one hand, looking desperately around. The pale woman's lip curled. She knew that look. She gestured. There was a man lying to one side, clutching a shattered leg. The girl grabbed him by the hair and slashed his throat open. A fountain of blood carried him to the ground. She sought another. A man head down, ass up, while he tried to hold his organs in, was stabbed seven times in the back, splattering the girl with more blood. The pale woman watched her roam the battlefield, blood drunken, sobbing like an animal. She killed. She killed, and she killed, and she killed. Had the tall, pale woman let them all live, only for her to come and finish them off for her vengeance? 
What a horrid, selfless blood angel she was. When at last the girl slowed down, chest heaving from exhaustion, the woman stood watch over her in case she wanted more. She did nothing to comfort her. Not yet. Let her get her fill and scream at the cruel world until she felt better. The racking, screaming sobs tore through the trees. The girl stabbed at the earth, stabbing and flailing until she collapsed onto her hands and knees. She panted. Moving quickly, the witch reached out with one powerful hand, murmuring through a long, forbidden spell. She pulled at the souls of the men gathered around her. It was like pulling on a stump and feeling the roots cling to their earth. The connection was deep, but not unbreakable. She tore their lives from their bodies, and a hundred invisible threads formed. The souls fleeing to the afterlife were snatched up before they went beyond the final veil. She dragged them back, screaming and clawing at the earth. They connected like a spider's web to the gypsy girl's spine. Their lives are yours now. They will not completely die. But that does not mean that they cannot suffer. The pale woman turned, scenting the air for the nearest body of water. Come, we'll throw these wretches into the lake so they can't hurt anyone ever again. The girl looked up at her red all over with blood. She nodded, throwing the knife aside. It took two days to throw all one hundred bodies into the lake, filling it with blood and body parts until it turned a sickly dead color. The mud at the bottom stirred, never settling, but none of them ever re-emerged. The girl bathed herself in the chilly nearby brook, wrapping herself in scraps and trying to remember what color her skin was under all that blood. She felt raw all over. Later, she sat hugging her legs to her chest, dressed in the pale woman's traveling cloak. Melody, come, our work is done. She looked to one side, at the small line of graves that she'd been kind enough to help her dig. There was nothing left. Melody, come, the woman said again, reaching for her with a white hand. Melody took her hand slowly and was hauled to her feet. E yes, Master Dahlia, the witch led the Roma girl far away from there, Promising to return some day, if the weather was right, they had work to do. Men to kill, babies to deliver, sicknesses to start and cure wherever the coin was the heaviest. The world was an unfair, cruel, bloody place, and it would only favor the strong and the powerful. Dahlia took a liking to the girl she'd rescued and decided to keep her as an apprentice. She could sense the fury, the growing strength, and the tiny flame of potential for magic. A lengthy test proved that she had the raw ability for magic, which was a godsend. There needed to be more women learning the arts these days. Baptized in blood as she had been, Melody learned at a voracious rate. Once she grasped how to read and write, no book was safe from her. They visited monasteries, druid circles, and more to teach her the ancient ways. Melody matured into a cruel, powerful young woman in Dahlia's own image, she learned how to make rats sick and send them into ships. She learned how to force men and women alike to speak the truth by magic or put them through racking pain. 
She learned to enjoy black and decay and taking what she wanted by force. The world was cruel, so she became crueler still. She enjoyed the power it gave her over others. When she was ready and had a basic grasp of magical things, she was presented to the queen of all metacreatures, Gaia the Antlered Woman, as Calliope the Black, apprentice of Dahlia the Black. In the palace, as was her right, she received a formal education. Dahlia left her there for years so that she could learn socialize, and be near others like herself. Blood and sex and gold made the world go round in Calliope's eyes, so she focused her work on math and economics. With a greater grasp on money and how it flowed, she became rich enough to match her magical prowess. When she emerged a graduate, Dahlia returned to collect her for further training. Those were golden years of witchcraft, coin, and adventure. Luscious boys followed in a line one after another, each sexually talented in his own way. Investment and compound interest made her change her name a number of times. She fled both spurned lovers and socioeconomic assassinations. The two women set up a cottage in the deepest part of the European countryside where no road would go and no explorer would reach. It was near the lake where the Templar lay in their eternal torment. Wolves and brambles guarded them on all sides while Dahlia guided her teachings. Dahlia named the place the Wayward Web, as all the paths and the ways through the wood crisscrossed each other in a wild tapestry of confusing patterns. Anyone that didn't get killed by wolves or suffered death by a thousand cuts in the brambles would have two witches to deal with if they somehow arrived at their door. Dahlia poured everything she could into melody. Spell-weaving, sexual charm, earth-grown medicine, politics everything she could do to make the young woman strong. She was no longer the meek, blood-stained fawn that she'd found on the roadside hundreds of years ago. She had grown. Late in Melody's training, Master Dahlia was caught by superstitious, non-magic users. The world had evolved into a land of cannons, muskets, and crossbows. The spoken magical word was not as quick as a crossbow bolt to the knee. They took her when Melody was away gathering herbs, and by the time she tracked her master down, the witch burning had already been done. With rat and fire, mudslide and fist-held lightning, Melody wiped the entire town off the face of the earth. She started with the church and their witch hunters. She moved to their whorehouse and taverns. She spared no child in the orphanage, nor their school moms or their child-touching priests. They could all burn in hell. Like a force of nature, she killed them all and left no stone atop another. Melody left Master Dahlia's charred corpse tied to the stake where she'd been when she'd arrived. She knew she would enjoy the view better from there and be proud of how powerful she'd become. Then she waited. A group of hunters came with meat and furs to sell, not realizing that the town was gone. She killed them. A traveling musical theater of fools and songstresses came, as they did every year. She killed them. An ironsmith with a cart of tools and nails came, always happy to sell to farmers and builders. She killed him. 
A group of thirty men with thick armor and horses came, justice aflame in their hearts. She killed them. A group of high-ranking church officials and a pair of exorcists arrived, wanting to cleanse the land of evil. She killed them, too. Melody killed and killed and killed until the only road into town began to grow with weeds and new plant life. Nature began to reclaim the land. The surrounding farms grew wild and attracted all sorts of game with predators to match them. The local wolf population swelled enormously. No man or child of man dared come into the area anymore. The region whispered of a woman garbed in black that wandered the countryside, slaughtering everything that crossed her path. They said she couldn't be killed. They said she controlled the weather and drank blood. They said she slept with wolves and commanded men to kill themselves with a word. Years later, when the town was little more than an overgrown ruin, Melody returned to it once more. Master Dahlia's corpse had long decayed and vanished into dust. Melody used powder, herbs, magic words, and raw power to enact her rituals there by moonlight. Rituals that made her skin boil over and her body split open. Through raw magic power and force of will, Melody Black began to grow extra limbs and hair all over herself. She turned dark and enormous and many-legged, clambering into the trees that had grown over the years. She delighted in the dexterity, the power. Her long black hair bannered this way and that while she traveled upside down through the branches, minding all of her new extra limbs. Sticky strands followed in her wake, and she used them to make little bridges that only she could cross without sticking to them. A meta-creature. A spider. She'd done it. All alone, she'd done it. Glorious. She was simply glorious. Then something went wrong. Something snagged when she began to turn herself back. Her face didn't... couldn't quite... She was hit in the recoil and the runes burned, sending her rolling. She went to the nearest body of water to lean over and look at herself. Mandible. She shrieked at her ugliness, pulling at them. They were attached and painful. Unpacking her strength, she returned to the gigantic spider form, and then back again. The mandibles remained. There was something else attached to her, something twisting in the threads of her metacreature magic, something older and more powerful. <gasps> She flinched, touching her back. Master Dahlia's spell. Oh, God, she'd intertwined her metacreature form with the necromancy, keeping the Templar knights in their living hell in the lake. She turned to Spider and back. Turned to Spider and back. Then again and again and again, always the large, hairy mandibles remained. Her beauty was marred by the spooky things hanging off of her face. The entire thing split open like some sort of monster. She sat with her head in her hands. Just as well. She was a monster on the inside. She looked around the ruin that she'd created in her fury. May as well be a monster on the outside as well. It would make finding willing lovers a bit more difficult, but there were potions and glamour spells for that, if she ever felt the itch. As a metacreature, time was a little less valuable now. She had hundreds, perhaps thousands of years ahead of her now. 
She delighted at the idea. She would outlive them, if nothing else. Outlive them all. All of them with their ropes and fires and penises and crossbow bolts. All of them would turn to dust before her, by her magic or by the simple passage of time. Imbeciles. Imbeciles, all of them. She a monster? Perhaps. But they were imbeciles. You could put on a glamour spell to make yourself look better. You could improve your hearing or your voice with a potion. You could change your hair or your height or your eyes with magic. But idiocy was forever. Melody wasn't stupid. She was strong, smart, educated, powerful. She was better than all of them combined, and everything she ever wanted was hers for the taking. A meta-creature had all the time and power that the world had to offer. Queen Gaia sat in her castle, but never told anyone how to live their lives. The world was hers to enjoy now, monstrous face or no. She needed a new name. A name that would suit her and her new face, one that would strike terror into her enemies. She decided on Lady Calliope Black Spider.